Thanks for checking out this message from Faith Family Church in Shiloh, Illinois. We hope that what you hear inspires you to follow Jesus and love others. Hey, and we're so grateful to be a part of your week. Don't forget that you can give online and keep up with all of our events and so much more at myffc.info. Starting a series about negative emotions, it's called uh, I'm Not Okay and That's Okay. I think that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we face tough stuff and we deal with negative emotions and things like depression and shame and anger and, and those kinds of things that, uh, that, that we face in our lives and in our culture, what I see in our culture, and I see it even in Christian culture, there is this, there's this intolerance towards negative emotions and in, an impatience with it, and maybe even towards others, a, a judgment about their negative emotions. And it's not like we, we don't, it's not just that we don't like them and want to get rid of them as fast as we can. There's something deeper than that. I think we, 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 it's not just that we're saying, I don't like feeling this way, but we're saying, I ought not feel this way, or worse, pointing at others, saying, you shouldn't feel that way. And so, uh, uh, you know, too often, I think we are, we're hard on ourselves when we experience negative emotions or, or, or impatient with others who experience them, or maybe who experience them too long, you know. It's okay to feel these ways, but uh, as long as it's no more than five minutes, uh, that's the limit. We're sort of like kids on a car trip. What do kids say on a car trip? Are we there yet? And, 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 and this sort of thing with people who go through negative emotions, even ourselves, we say, are you better yet? You know? So I want to talk about dealing with negative emotions. I'm not so much going to say defeating them as if, you know, I've written a book called Getting Total Victory Over Every Negative Emotion for the Rest of Your Life, $29.95 on Amazon. <laughs> I don't want to go there because I think that kind of thinking is unrealistic and sets up unrealistic expectations. Look, as long as we live in this life, we're going to face negative emotions and we're going to keep learning how to respond to them in a way that keeps God in the center of things. Jesus said it clearly. He said, God, before he left, he said to all of us, look, in the world, you'll face trouble. Things like rejection and unfairness and loss and provocation, etc., all of which all of which produce emotional pain. But Jesus says, "Then take heart; I've overcome the world." Now, what does that mean? I've, I've heard sermons that say that sort of preach that in a way that negates what Jesus just said. You're going to have trouble, as if Jesus were saying, "Hey, you're going to have trouble, but hey, cheer up; you won't have any trouble," which makes no sense at all. When Jesus says, I've overcome the world, what he means is rather that we can face negative emotions and learn to respond to them with Jesus' help. We can take heart because he's there to help us and journey with us. We can take heart because no matter what we're going through, there's always another in the fire with us. So... I want to talk in the next several weeks of how we journey through negative emotions. And I say journey through them. Uh, but I, I, I just want to give some, some, uh, some, some advice here, I could call it. We're, we'll never find a pathway through negative emotions if we try to deny them. You know, that's, well, that's not what's going on inside me. You know, there must be fatigue. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. We're like the Wizard of Oz, you know. It must be bad pizza. It must be somebody else's fault. I'm, I, I can't be having negative emotions because if I'm not okay, then that's not okay. Well, what I'm trying to say to you in the next several weeks is it's okay to not be okay. We won't find a pathway through negative emotions if we, if we try to hide them from those around us. You know, I'm fine. I'm fine. Like Bob Wiley and what about Bob going down the street? I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, you can tell by looking at him that he's not fine. You know, I can't let anyone know my struggle. I can't let anyone know my feelings and how negative they are because if I do, they may reject me. And so I'm not okay, and that's not okay. I think that's wrong. We'll never find a pathway through negative emotions if we keep trying to deflect them through distracting activities. You know, we get like the energizer of bunny. Just go, 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 work, 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 do, 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 do. We just keep doing and going. And you got to keep moving because if you stop moving, you'll start thinking. 
And then all of a sudden you get quiet too long and you'll start to notice those emotions. And somehow in our culture and sometimes even in church we've been taught that that's not okay. But I'm here to tell you if you're not okay, that's okay. We'll never get through negative emotions if we, if we bury them. Now this happens to us over time. Years of denial and, and deflecting can put some negative emotions deep down into our minds, really outside of our conscious awareness, and yet they still affect us. Sometimes we think that this deflection, this denial, we, if, as Christians, we think it's a, a, a faith in some way, you know, that, that well, I'm just standing and, I, you know, I'm going to deny all these things. Uh, p- please let's understand the difference between a stand of faith and denial. They're not the same thing. And there is, obviously, there's a time to stand up in the face of adversity and sing God's praises. You know, like the prophet Habakkuk says at the end of his three chapters of prophecy, he says, though all the crops fail, meaning for them in an agricultural society, if everything falls to pieces, still I will rejoice in the Lord. That's in the scripture. That's a, that's a good thing to do and a proper thing to do. But, you know, I want you to, I, I want to remind you that uh, that. Habakkuk says that uh, after expressing in harsh detail the disillusionment and pain he's experiencing over God's lack of action on their behalf. And if we just read the last parts of of Habakkuk's uh, prophecy and skip all the earlier cries of pain throughout that entire prophecy that he spoke, I think we've missed a vital part of the process. Now, we're going to be looking at the Psalms and one of the Psalms today because I believe the book of Psalms teaches us how to journey through negative feelings without denying them, without deflecting them. Now, if you're thinking that the book of Psalms is just a book of praises, uh, that's a mistake. The, The book of Psalms has a lot of praise in it, but it's more than a book of praise, okay? There are all kinds of songs in the book of, in the book of Psalms. You're probably aware of this. There's songs of exuberant uh, celebration, you know? Clap your hands, all you people. Sh- all ye people. I did it again. I'm sorry. I was raised on the King James Bible, and so forsooth of a truth, yea, verily, sometimes it doth pop out of my mind. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. There's, there's other examples like that. There, there are sighs of relief, songs of joy and relief. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Selah. You know what Selah means there? It means whew. No, it doesn't mean that. I'm making that up. There there are quiet songs of contemplation, you know. Uh, uh, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight or her her delight is in the law of the Lord. That's a contemplative psalm of wisdom. But I got to tell you, you run into this, you read the psalms. You ever notice there's a lot of blues in the psalms? Yeah, straight out of the Mississippi Delta, man. There are some, there's some blues in there. This collection of prayers that we call the Psalms, it's the prayer manual for the church, never hides or deflects or denies the presence of emotional pain and anguish. There's a scholar named Dr. Walter Brigham, he's an Old Testament scholar, and he wrote a book called The Message of the Psalms. And, uh, and in this book, he, he divides the Psalms into three basic categories, okay? He says there are Psalms of orientation. Things are going well, you know. There are Psalms of disorientation. Things are going terrible. I know that's not good grammar. All you English majors, send your emails to Margie. It should say things are going terribly, but I just felt like being more colloquial. There are psalms of disorientation. Things are going terribly. There are psalms of new orientation. Things are going well again. And many of the psalms are are various combinations of these kinds of themes. I want to focus today on psalms of disorientation. These are psalms of lament, depression, protest, accusation. Some of them are full of anger towards enemies. A technical term for that is imprecatory psalms. Sounds like a dirty word. Imprecatory psalms, you know. And I think it's a big mistake for us to skip these. 
or to, or to do what I've done for many years, to hurry through the difficult parts, you know. I find myself hurrying through them because I'm thinking, dang, I don't want that to happen to me. So <laughs> just move on to the happy part at the end. And here's why I think these, these psalms of disorientation are important to us. Psalms of disorientation give us permission to experience and express negative emotions. Say it again. Psalms of disorientation give us permission to experience and express negative emotions. I'll put it another way. These psalms tell us that it's okay to not be okay. You know, well, what are you saying, Rick, that we should stay not okay? No. I mean, nobody wants to keep feeling miserable. I get that. What I mean is that we don't need to feel ashamed or weak or foolish or lacking in faith if we're not okay right now. We don't need to feel like losers or like we're somehow disappointing Jesus. You know, so often it's fear and shame or pride that pushes us into denial and deflection. And I have to add, you know, we've made a theme this year that we want to graciously accept people's spiritual journeys. You know what that means? We can never judge other people because they're not okay. We want to say as a church, it's okay if you're not okay right now. We still love you. You know, have you ever caught yourself, no show of hands here, have you ever caught yourself thinking about a person who's had a long-term struggle? Well, they should be better by now. Or... I feel good, why don't they? <laughs> or try to tell them, you know, you should count your blessings. Now, that's a good thing. We should all count our blessings. But there's a time for that kind of thing. Don't try to encourage those who mourn. What does the Bible say? Mourn with those who mourn. doesn't say encourage those who mourn. doesn't say rebuke those who mourn because they're mourning. You know, well, they should count their blessings. Oh, uh, here's another one. You know, we think in our mind, well, they, well, if they just had more faith, which we add, like me. Uh... Oh, here's another one. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I went through the same thing, and it didn't take me this long to get over it. Well, you know what? Each of us is individual. We've got unique histories and unique temperaments, and uh, I, I want to just point out to you Psalm, uh, Proverbs 14.10, which says, Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. There's another translation that says it this way. No one else can know your sadness, and strangers cannot share your joy. That's from the NCV. I think it's the new Canadian version, I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> this is the, the NIV is the new Illinois version. <laughs> Governor Pritzker, you know, put that together, yeah. But <laughs> here till Thursday, folks. All right. <laughs> We each experience what we experience in our own ways. You get what I'm saying. So the disorientation psalms tell us that God isn't judging us or criticizing us or rejecting us when we're not okay. So we're going to look at Psalm chapter 6, and uh, I'm going to read the beginning portion, that little intro section. It says, for the director of music with stringed instruments, uh, according to the Sheminith, no one knows what that means, a psalm of B.B. King. <laughs> now, to those of you who don't know, if you're younger and you're uh, culturally deprived, B.B. King is the master of the blues, absolute master of the blues. Look, so if you've never heard of B.B. King, when you leave this place, fire up your Spotify and type into the search part, uh, the thrill is gone. <laughs> You will experience the blues. Yeah. Well, of course, no, it's a psalm of David. And here's, here's what it says. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail 
because of all my foes. I just want to just dig into this a bit in the moments we have left. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. My bones are in agony. Uh, let me paraphrase, okay? This is 21st century language. God, I am worn out, okay? I'm flat out exhausted here. And you know what else? This really hurts. Please have mercy on me, God. I'm at the end of my rope. Anybody here, and I don't need to raise hands, ever felt that way? Or you ever said it to God? Or do, do you think that we're allowed to say that kind of thing to God? The, the psalmist goes on, my soul is in deep anguish. How long? How long, Lord? In other words, God, I'm more than disappointed. I'm downright depressed. Notice, deep anguish and this depression is killing me how long I don't know how much longer I can take this God have you have you forgotten me have you abandoned me how long before you start caring about me again and if this sounds to you like a bit of an accusation that's because it is you know, there's a, there's a translation in the New Testament called the Cotton Patch Translation. I asked the first service. Nobody had heard of it, but I am telling the truth. Google it. After you Spotify B.B. King and Google <laughs> Cotton Patch Translation. And uh, it, it uses a bit of profanity, you know, to get a point across. So, you know, in Romans 6.1, what shall we say? Shall we continue sinning that grace may abound? Hell no. That's the Cotton Patch Translation. Well, uh, I'm going to give you the Cotton Patch Psalms. Where the hell are you, God? Oh, Rick, I can't believe it. There are children in here. You shouldn't use that kind of language, especially with God. Okay, so I'm going to say this real clearly. I'm going to say it on the Internet, all right? I am not advocating cursing. But I'll tell you what I am advocating. I'm advocating that we stop trying to be polite with God. That I'm advocating. And I'm advocating it because the Psalms of disorientation are not polite and refined. They are raw, unfiltered, disturbing, what polite Christians would call inappropriate. I hate that word. I really believe that mass murder is so inappropriate. <laughs> Uh, you know, inappropriate. I, here's why I think God's got those in there. Because I think, I'm not saying God wants us to curse. I'm not saying that. But I think God would, confer, would, would prefer cursing to posing. The psalmist goes on, turn, Lord, deliver me, save me because of, my un because of your unfailing love. Among the, <laughs> among the dead, no one praises your name. Who praises you from the grave? Hey, if this sounds snarky to you, it's because it is. God, corpses ain't going to praise you. Worship doesn't come out of a coffin, God. I mean, if you want praise, I can't do it dead. Oh, can, we, can we actually talk to God like that? Well, apparently we can. Because this kind of language is all over the Psalms. In fact, Dr. Brigham says that Psalms of Lament make up one-third of the entire collection of songs. One-third uh, of, of the psalms is this kind of raw, unfiltered language toward God. It's also found in other places in Scripture. I mean, there's a, there's a whole book of the Bible that's called the blues. Actually, it's called Lamentations, but it's the blues. You know, what? I, all I know from Lamentations is his, his mercies are new every morning. Yeah, that's one verse out of five chapters, guys. We always rush to the middle, Lamentations. And in my Bible reading, oh, yeah, I get through to the middle. Oh, his mercies are new. I'm not saying that's not true, but there's a, there's a reason the rest of the book is there. And I think what this is saying is that not only can we speak this way, but I think there are times when we should speak this way. There are seasons when God encourages us to do so. And that's why one-third of the Psalms are in this category. The, uh, the, the man I came up in ministry under, Pastor Ron Tucker, uh, it's a dear friend of ours. Uh, he's, he's preached here before. His story of transformation happened to him when he was in army boot camp. 
Uh, he was raised in a very strict religious home, a Pentecostal home. Uh, there was a lot of preaching about the judgment of God, and you never know when Jesus is going to come. And he might, you know, if you're thinking a bad thought when he comes, well, tough for you. And uh, that's why people get saved every Sunday night, just to make sure they don't get left behind. And, uh, and so he had that kind of upbringing, and then he went to boot camp, and it was the most hellish experience he'd ever had. He got three quarters of the way through boot camp, and he got stress fractures. And he had to pull out of the physical training for some time. And the doctor said, if this goes on too long, you're going to have to go all the way back to the beginning and do basic from the beginning again. So when, when he, they released him from the doctor's office, Ron says he went up onto to a private place on the base where he could be by himself. And he just had it out with God. He told God exactly what he thought of him. He says, you have let me down. You have brought me to this hell hole. And now you're making me go through this again. And you've not been there for me. And blah, 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 blah. And, and, and he just kind of, just without using profanity, cussed out God. And then he said, I waited for the lightning to strike me. Because <laughs> everything he'd be taught said, no, if you talk that way to God, you're going to be a pile of ash, baby. You know, and, uh, and then he said the opposite happened. He said he got a, he heard a voice in his mind from God saying, Ron, I love you. And he had a physical experience. Not everybody has this, but he said, I, I felt like warm honey was being poured over my entire body. And all that fear and anxiety just drained out of him. And he just got overwhelmed with the love of God. It was a life transforming experience. And I got to tell you, I met him about six months after that had happened. He had a little group in his basement and his life transformation God used to become my life transformation. And this happened when he went out and gave God a talking to, told him, give, give him a piece of his mind. And I, this, is my, this is my interpretation of it. Maybe that's when God, maybe God did that because that's when he finally got real with God. When we stopped posing. You know, like, now, I got to say, like most psalms, this, this psalm of disorientation makes the turn. I call it the turn. You ever notice in the psalms, it's bad, it's awful, it's bad, but, I love those buts, um, and I cannot lie, uh, <laughs> but God, you know, and, and it, it and, now don't go there, all right, it's channeling Will Smith, uh, it makes the turn towards something positive. So let's look at the turn here in Psalm 6, verse 8. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. David ends by restating his trust in God. He realizes that deliverance is in his future and he gains assurance of God's answering. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, even if it's a small one. But let me say this. This does not negate the pain and the frustration that he is e expressing. I think he probably still feels terrible. I think he's still depressed. That's why we've got to learn to sing in the valleys and not thinking, well, I didn't feel better. I'm going to give God praise in the valley just because he's worth praise no matter what I feel like. God's always worthy of praise. I'm just going to do it. And what I'm asking you to do is not to let that turn in these psalms cause you to ignore the lament, skip over to the end, to treat the turn as if it's the only important part of that psalm. I have to tell you, recently I have found such deep personal resonance in the psalms of disorientation. Now, Margie and I have been doing ministry together now for 40 years, four decades of ministry. And, uh, and, and I got to tell you, this past year, the year called COVID from hell, has been the hardest thing Margie have, and I have ever faced in 40 years of ministry. This is the worst, toughest year we've ever faced. I'm telling you what, Margie and I have learned in a new way what Paul meant when he said, I've served the Lord with great humility and with tears tears and in the midst of severe testing. In fact, I look up all the places in the New Testament. Paul said he cried. He cried a lot. I found myself in the emotions expressed in these psalms 
of, of uh, disorientation. And it's, it's helped me to say, it's okay, Rick, that you, f- that you feel this way. You don't have to stay this way, but it's okay that you feel this way now. I've added to my prayer life the cry, oh God, have mercy on me. I don't know what to do. You know, last year, what people saying, what's the plan, Rick? I wanted to say, I'm wide open, you know. <laughs> Where are we going? God! It helped me. Now, why do some people skip the Psalms of disorientation? Now, like I said, some feel that they're inappropriate. Uh, I, I think that's a big mistake. I think if we skip these expressions, then our prayer and worship is in danger of becoming a kind of posing before God. As if, as if we have to get over our depression before we come to God. As if we have to leave our grief at the door. As if we have to rid ourselves of all shame before we approach God. Look, I know you are smart enough to know that's exactly backwards of how God wants us to relate to Him. God already knows how we're feeling. You know, we can't do this to God. I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, He sees, no matter how good actors, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm fine. Oh, oh yeah. We do that really well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. God sees right through that because he sees the heart. He already knows how we feel, and he wants us to tell him how we feel instead of bottling up on the inside and trying to stick on a plastic happy face. God wants us to know that it's okay to say to him, God, I'm not okay. Why do we dismiss the psalm? Sometimes I think some people dismiss these psalms because they admit weakness. And no one wants to be seen as weak or to see themselves that way. But you know, the the, sort of the grandfather of the Psalms, David, was a warrior. But he didn't care what people thought of what he was going through. His prayer life wasn't meant to impress the people around him with his great spiritual strength. He admitted his struggle with God. He knew that that if you're weak, that, that you're not weak if you say, I'm not okay. Here's another big one with Christians. Some Christians jump over these psalms because they think to speak this way expresses a lack of faith. And I want to challenge that idea head on. In fact, I think the exact opposite is true. I think these laments and complaints and protests and accusations are really bold acts of faith. Why do you say that? Well, number one, they have the courage of honesty. The courage of honesty. As Dr. Brighamman says, these psalms insist that the world must be experienced as it really is and not in some pretended way. And they have, they have faith because in all of these unfiltered raw statements, they're all directed to God. In all of David's cries of pain and, and protest, he's talking to God. He's not talking about God. He's talking to him. He's talking to a God that he believes is there. You know, if he didn't believe that, he wouldn't be saying anything to God at all. Sort of like the atheist who's angry at God. You know, it always makes me chuckle. The, the atheist who's angry with God. And, and, and what makes these, here's what used to bother me. This is something Dr. Brighamman helped me sort out. I was always caught between the contradiction of the children of Israel complaining in the wilderness for which they were reprimanded, and the psalmist just complaining their heads off in one out of three psalms. I go, well, what makes this okay, and uh, you know, to the psalms okay, and what Israel did in the wilderness sinful? What, what's the deal? The difference is to who you're talking to. In the desert, Israel wasn't talking to God. They were talking about God. They didn't think God was there at all. In fact, they'd given up on him. They even made their own gods and went back to Egypt. But through all David's cries of pain, he's still talking to a God that he is still counting on. None of of these complaints in the Psalms represent anyone walking out on God like Israel did. So I want to say this to you. You don't lack faith. If you say, I'm not okay right now. In fact, I think that's what part of the reason the Psalms of disorientation are there. To tell us it's okay to not be okay. Uh, To tell us that honesty about our negative emotions is essential for us getting through them. So can I say this to you? You're not crazy. You're not pathetic. You're not 
disappointing Jesus when you experience negative emotions. You are experiencing what every human being has ever experienced, what every woman of God, a man of God has ever experienced, including Jesus himself. And I'll leave you with this thought. The greatest lament ever spoken came from the mouth of Jesus, the Son of God. He was deserted by his close friends. He was betrayed by one of his own. He was mocked and cursed for making true claims about himself and his purpose. They hung him naked on the most shameful instrument of execution ever devised. And at that darkest hour the, that the earth has ever witnessed, he cried out this lament, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Let me tell you something. Jesus knows what it feels like to be rejected and abandoned and betrayed. He knows what it's like to be shamed and humiliated. He knows what it's like to have sorrow so deep you think you're going to die. He knows what it's like to have God seem like he's a million miles away from you. He is the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But in that moment of supreme agony, he still trusted God. Where do you see, where do you see trust in that cry of abandonment? Because he says, my God, my God, because his cry was directed to his God. Jesus allowed this to happen to, uh, to him for our sake so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be brought into right relationship with the God who made us and loves us, so that he could help us during our seasons of disorientation, so that he could journey through them at our side and show us the way through and out of them, so that he could be in any situation we face, the other in the fire with us. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I ask you, to, uh, to, to help us to learn how to be more and more honest with you as the Psalms demonstrate for us so clearly, Lord. Teach us to walk in this, to keep uh, 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 real with you. And I pray for those that are going through a dark valley, God. Let them know you're with them in the fire. And though they may be in it a little longer, you're never going to leave them. I pray, God, that nobody at Faith Family Church will ever be judgmental or critical of someone who's not okay right now. May we be a church that graciously accepts people where they are in their life's journey. I pray for those that have not received Christ, those who are living far from you, Lord God. I ask you to speak to hearts right now by your Holy Spirit. If you just keep your heads bowed and you're watching online, I want to give you an opportunity to get right with the God who made you, to, to be made right in his sight. You know, Jesus died to take away our sin, all the wrongdoing we've done that separates us from God. And I want to lead you in a simple prayer of commitment and faith in Jesus Christ. And if, if you're ready today to make that commitment, then I want you to say these words with me. Just repeat them out loud if you're in a place watching online where you can do that. If you're in this room, let's all say it together to help those who need to, 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 who need to pray this prayer. Say it with me. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I acknowledge that I've sinned. I need your forgiveness. I invite Jesus to come into my heart. <clears throat> Take away my sin to make me new on the inside. Jesus, I take hold of your hand. You're gonna walk with me through everything that I face in this life, and I will follow you for the rest of my days. Amen and amen. Thanks for being a part of this week's message. If what you heard has impacted you, be sure to click subscribe and share with somebody you know who would be encouraged by it. And to take the next step here at Faith Family Church, head on over to myffc.info.